today we have Tony Moon. You guys, I have been trying for a very long time. All the girls on the team know that I have been looking for a rooftop Korean who can properly tell the story and provide context to the situations of the past and what we're dealing with now when we see this resurgence. Specifically, what really caught my eye on this is all the memes. There was all these rooftop Korean memes. Did you see these, Tony? After the 2020 Black Lives Matter riot started, I started seeing all these memes about rooftop Koreans, and I was like, what the heck are these things? And then I realized it was an entire awesome story back from 1992 in the LA riots, and that connected later to communism in Korea. So I've just been really excited about having you on because I know that you have quite a story yourself and you can provide some context for everybody out there and connect some important dots. Cool. Thanks, thanks for coming thanks for, on. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't aware of those memes. Um, like, as I'm sure as prolific as they were on the internet, <laughs> um, I wasn't aware of that. I created, I, up until November of 2020, I didn't really have a social media presence. Um, really? Yeah, I didn't do Facebook, Instagram, uh, Twitter, and do anything like that. I was just basically living my life as a, as a father, raising two kids, um, going to tournaments. Uh, they do a lot of martial arts, so going to tournaments, and then uh, just you know my career. Um, but I think what really kind of um, set me off was watching the, the the riots, brought back a lot of memories in terms of what what I saw in the past, you know, what I went through in the past, which um, I never told my wife or my kids. Um, oh, really? That I was in '92 riots. Um, I kind of have a bit of a colorful background. So for me, it was just a week in my life. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, we're coming up on the 30 year anniversary of that, um, the end of April and beginning of May, because that's when the, uh, the verdict came down uh, at the end of April. And then um, the city went up in flames on, on, th on Thursday, because the, the verdict came on a Wednesday. And the city went up in flames on a Thursday. And then we ended up going out on um, the weekend, Friday and Saturday. But um, it was, fairly short lived, but in that small space of time, there were uh, so many fires. You know, I think what made <clears throat> it different um, compared to 2020, I guess uh, looking at uh, LA is that uh, there was a part of LA that, that burned um, throughout that week. And I think the estimated damages was about half, half a billion dollars. And a lot of these shopkeepers and owners, small business owners, didn't have insurance because it was per, so prohibitively expensive to have insurance in those areas. Mm -hmm. So a lot of them lost their livelihood, um, and uh, they ended up ended up working at like a gas station or as a janitor um, because they lost everything without the insurance. But wow. yeah, I wasn't aware of that, um, and I, I basically went online and I saw that, and I said, you know, I'll pick up that that name. And then I created a Twitter account in November um, after the, the election. That coupled with the lockdown was what, um, I guess, pushed me over to the side where I was like, you know what, um, I'm gonna have to say something and um, you know, get out there you know, in terms of voicing my opinion of what's going on. But yeah, I created that Twitter account. I didn't realize like uh, there would be so many things I can talk about. So one of the first things I did was talking about how the lockdown was affecting the small businesses because I'm a byproduct of small business. Yeah. Uh, my father owned a store in, in Huntington Park and in uh, Boyle Heights. Um, during the riots, we didn't, we, he sold those stores prior to the riots. Um, but I know what it feels like to be an immigrant family, uh, to work in the stores and to where everybody works and to see that go up in flames. I mean, that's like your livelihood. You know, and you watch like your parents sacrifice and, and do all these things, working long hours, and then you got to put in the hours too. Um, vacation is pretty much like uh, Christmas and New Year's; those are the only two days you take off. But uh, the, the the concept of a, an American vacation, where you take the summer off or you have like a week off or even a month off, is really foreign you know, for us. You know, for me growing up. Yeah. So when I saw the the uh, the riots and then I saw the election results, that really kind of I guess it triggered me. I was like, just really upset. Oh, that's very interesting. I I like to hear what was the spark for people, like good average men and women, what gave them that jump, the jump start that they needed to get involved. So it, it makes sense that that was for you. Now, there's so many places we can start. Mm -hmm. So going back to that meme stuff, I was fascinated by this because as the riots were starting to happen, there was memes and there was tweets and people were alluding to, we need to bring back the rooftop Koreans. 
I had no idea what that term was. And I consider myself a history buff. And so right. I was like, hmm. I looked into it. And the connection of the Korean community in L.A. and then their connection to the military training that they had back in Korea, experiencing communism back then, trying to protect their home country, their communities, their families, immigrating to America and bringing that experience with them, and then being able to defend their communities in America when the police abandoned them as the race riots started. But then what made it even crazier to me was seeing the behavior of everybody back then with the verdict being revealed, it was exactly what happened in 2020 with everybody's waiting to see mm -hmm. if there's gonna be riots because of people being unhappy mm -hmm. with the verdict. And seeing that and knowing we had not learned a single thing about that in the education system, that's what really made me want to look more into it and start telling the story. So I think what might be smart is we could talk about your family's story first and how you, what was the origin story from Korea to where you came to be now? Right. Um, so I didn't come from Korea. Yeah. I was actually born in Germany. Oh, sorry about that. And I know no, that. no, that's fine. It's, it's not, I'm kind of like a really small minority of um, Koreans that were born in Germany. And this was because during a time when uh, the Korean government was basically uh, strapped for cash, they needed um, money to help, you know, help. So basically Germany, West Germany at that time, offered a, um, a program where they can bring in uh, young laborers and then the men worked in the coal mines and then the women were, came as nurses. So my parents met in Germany and you know I was born in Germany. And then I immigrated here when I was about six years old. Uh, so um, the only time I went back to Korea was when I was about maybe two and my parents sent me back to visit my you know, grandparents and then, then I came back to Germany. But um, yeah, so from that time I've been in LA like my whole life. Yeah. You know, and um, regarding like uh, what happened during the war, like Korean War, those are stories that gets passed down. Like uh, we, at least for us as a family, um, my aunt and my grandfather, they passed down certain stories because a lot of it's very painful. Um, my grandfather was, um, I mean, he lived in a, a very small village town. It's kind of like a, like a mayor, you know, he's kind of the go-to guy that everybody went to because he was really affable and just kind of talked to everybody. And um, North Koreans had a list of all these people when they actually invaded the South. They actually had lists of people that they wanted to round up and, and gather. And my, my grandfather and his brothers were on that list. So they ended up hiding up in the hills and in the caves. And eventually they were forced to come down because they threatened to kill like some of the other family members. Um, stories like that. And then stories of having to leave their home uh, in, in um, the dead of night you know, because they were being sought after. And this was after so many times that the North Korean army had taken my grandfather out into the fields, threatening to kill him. Um, they, numerous times they've done that as a way of psychological torture, telling him that they're gonna kill him, you know, and um, they're gonna kill him and his family unless like he divulges certain information. So um, one of the stories that I've heard was that uh, it was <clears throat> one particular night, like they were, he had, the the feeling that they they were going to actually go through with it but uh u.s army choppers flew overhead and the north korean army fled at that point in which he was able to get the rest of our family and and, and uh, you know go to the south but these stories need to be passed on from like parent to child as a way of legacy to kind of instill in them like you know things are great here i mean this is a wonderful country uh, but it's not always been this way for us as a family you know in the places that we've lived and these are some of the things that we went through, right? I think with that, that's where you can prevent a lot of the indoctrination that's going on in college campuses right now with yeah. a lot of these lefty professors that are out there uh, talking about socialism, you know, soft socialism, which is gonna end up leading to communism, making it attractive to like these young minds, you know, students. And the reason why it's so attractive, because I, I always tell people free sounds good in any language. You, know, you say free, it doesn't matter what language you're speaking, it, sound, it always sounds good. Mm. But it's never free. It always comes at a cost. You know, there's a cost to your uh, your own freedom, silver liberties. Um, just it's, it doesn't come without any strings attached. And I think that's something a lot of um, uh, I guess the younger people have to learn. Uh, it, it doesn't work. You know, it's never worked, and it's never going to work. You know, but it's basically um, I think it comes every generation. I feel like I'm personally living during a time of my grandfather's. You know, I am my grandfather again at this time, right? Yeah. Which I never thought I'd, I'd end up being this way. But um, what kind of perspective does that give to you? Like, do you want to spread the word now? I do. As and, 
older male? Yeah, I do. And um, it, it's also self-realization that I'm much older now than I was, you know, because I think uh, in, in your mind, you're always a lot younger than your, your physical age. Mm -hmm. So it gives me a, a, uh, an opportunity to kind of talk about these things, right? And to say that um, it's not stuff I read out of a book, it's stuff that I've I've heard from stories and it's also stuff that I've lived through. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think that kind of puts an onus on me to kind of get out there and be more vocal. And I think that's why even now, I mean, I've been politically active in terms of what I'm doing um, in LA, you know, grassroots, you know, and it's, um, it's eye opening because I was never really politically active. And then you kind of see how, um, yeah, politics is a different type of money game business you know i'm a, consider myself a, a business person uh, but yeah politics is a different type of money game versus business and i prefer business <laughs> over politics yeah <laughs> it it's sure a lot is. cleaner yeah no i i'm curious too so i have a soft spot for interviewing people with family ties to asian countries mm -hmm. and it's it's for many reasons but it's just this forgotten these forgotten tales of history where I would say we learn a lot more about Nazi Germany, the USSR, if we learn anything about these situations in our history classes or we hear about them in the media. We do not hear about the tragedies that happened in Asia for some reason, whether mm -hmm. it's communist China or Cambodia. We yeah. interviewed a woman yesterday from Cambodia mm -hmm. and she was expressing something similar to you with your cousins of there are so many young people, and I hear this a lot about Korea specifically, there's so many young people in these generations in America that have fathers, grandfathers, grandmothers, just a couple generations away from them that survived communism or maybe didn't survive it, and now they're in America falling for the radical left. Have you heard anything or have you noticed anything? I heard it's just the Asian culture to be quiet and to not share these things. It's Part of it is it's, they're hard stories to tell mm -hmm. and so they don't get told. The other is there's this mentality of you don't share that kind of stuff to begin with. And that might be leading to the detriment of a lot of people. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Um, Asians, I think, um, East Asians, like Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, okay. really compliant. You know, they really kind of follow and they follow the rules and they try to conform. You know, they don't want to be the, you know, the, the, uh, the black sheep, you know, thing, the one that's sticking out. So there's a lot of conformity. And then I think when they come here, um, there's a sense of starting anew and not revisiting the past. Mm. So that's where the, all the stories gets buried without them realizing that, um, you know, I think Asian Americans, you know, the, the ones that came here are victims of their own success in the se sense that um, um, they basically are taught to, you know, go out, make money, you know, send your kids to college, buy a house, you know, do the whole retirement thing. And it's all uh, financially driven. Right, and it's all outly, out, outward success of what you have, what you drive, the house you have. It's all of that, without realizing that um, they're not instilling anything with their kids in terms of uh, real value. You know, like um, that hard work pays off. You know, that basically, um, you know, there were sacrifices made to come here. You know, without giving them that sense of, I guess, uh, history. You know, of knowing that. Um, what they went through to come here, there was a huge sacrifices and that they should appreciate that and really make the most of that opportunity, right? Um, but I think a lot of them grew up in a sense thinking that this is it, this is, you know, all that is, you know, without, you know, looking at uh, different parts of the world, especially like in Asia, you know, yeah. and you have uh, second, third generation Asians that are growing up without a sense of identity in terms of where they came from and why they're here. You know, they think, oh yeah, my parents just left wherever and they came here and, and now we're doing really well and I drive this Beamer or Mercedes and things are great, you know? Mm -hmm. So I can go along with whatever's being told on college campuses, like, you know, America's a, you know, a horrible country, they've, they've had slaves and this and that, without realizing, like, if you look at every country in the whole world, I mean, human beings are human beings, yeah. right? Um, Koreans, uh, Korea, we had slaves. Like um, in Korea, uh, you're categorized in the past according to your last name. So your last name denotes where you are in society. Really? So if you had a certain last name, then they're traced that back saying like you were part of the slave caste. Oh. You know, so if you have this la last name, you're part of like the aristocracy, you know. So they had that caste system too. And nobody talks about that, you know, because they think that, oh, it's only America, you know. But um, every country, if there is a way to... Uh, divide people up and differentiate them and make one group 
you know, um, I give them a hierarchy, they'll do that, you know. But I think in this country, it's it's um, it's given where you are, who you are based on the opportunities that you're given and then how hard you're working, you know. So America is not so like a bed, you know, it's, it's a ladder. You climb on the ladder, you're able to move up. Mm -hmm. Whereas in other countries, I mean, you're born and you're stuck where you are, Yeah. right? So like in North Korea, there's a caste system where you only have social, only certain social circles that you belong to. You can only marry in that social circle and you can only, you know, interact with the group in that social circle and you can't move up or down in that, in those groups. And they have it, uh, I guess, categorized and it's all secret and nobody really knows, but it's understood that you can only, you know, associate yourself with this, this group of people, which, I mean, I, I feel like America's trying to, uh, there's a small minority, I would say a small minority of the population here that's trying to take us in that direction as well. Which is crazy because if like if you really want to do that, let's just buy them a one-way ticket to North Korea or China and just send them there, and they can right? figure it out, right? Yeah. Right. Well, that's no why I like the the firsthand testimony, people's family stories, and unfortunately, there's so many people who could have given firsthand testimony, but they weren't asked these questions, and now they've passed away. And yeah. so, a lot of the times, it's more so sons and daughters that are telling their family stories. Um, I, I see the importance of firsthand testimony in so many ways. I get so frustrated. Speaking of social media trends with the rooftop Korean meme, I get so frustrated seeing people say, this is like 1984, that something happens with our government or with politics and they say, this is like V for Vendetta or hmm. whatever it is. But they're, they're referencing movies and Hollywood caricatures of tyranny, but they aren't connecting the dots and they aren't saying, wow, this reminds me of the Cultural Revolution in China. This reminds me of totalitarian thought control in the USSR. This reminds me of bureaucratic control of business that led to the seizing the means of production in Venezuela. Mm -hmm. I wish that we saw the behavior of our government today and of the cultural radicals and said, this reminds me of the past and we are seeing repeated behavior. Something about this idea of like the timidness or the, the quiet behavior, are you seeing that too with affirmative action? Because I cannot believe Asian Americans are so successful and their children are so successful that now they get hindered by things like affirmative action that are supposed to help minorities. But but where is the fight back? Where Do you see a fight back? I, am I missing it? Or why do you think that there isn't a greater fight against the situation? I think, I think it's because um, I, th there was a, a bill that was introduced by Ted Cruz last year mm -hmm. where he was going to limit federal funding to universities that have a, a quota system where they were going to exclude Asian Americans from entering certain schools yeah. um, because they want to you know, have equity, right? Um, I, I don't think it's really hit the Asian American community yet. Okay. I think there's that lagging effect. And demographically, we're like 7.5% of the whole U.S. population. And they lump us all together with Southeast Asians as well as in South Asians. So, I mean, if you're Indian or, or Pakistani, I mean, we're, we're all Asians, right? Um, so comprising all that, we're like 7.5% of the population. So really, we're really a minority of minorities, right? Yeah. But I, th I don't think it's really hit them yet, right? And um, they don't understand the repercussions of that. Like, for example, in California, uh, I think uh, the Cal State colleges are doing well with the SATs. Right, so SAT exams are no longer part of um, uh, being qualified to go to you know a higher education, which basically means you're going to be you know anybody can go. Right, so I tell my kids like you're going to be probably in college with some of the dumb kids. I mean, I hate to put it that way, but it's just you know some people are going to go to college, other people aren't going to go to college, right? And you have these exams to kind of differentiate what your life path is going to be. And not to say that college is going to be the end all be all for everyone. And in fact, I tell my kids, like, if you don't guys don't go to college, I'm okay with that, which for an Asian American, which is probably like the weirdest thing that comes out of anyone's mouth, right? Because we're all into higher education. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I have an MBA and everything, but I don't see that route anymore for them. You know, I see that as limiting now because I think now, I mean, if you can figure out what you want to do at a young age, like, let's say you want to fix air conditioners, right? Or you want to be an electrician or something like that. That's fine. I mean, I think that's going to be a better route than, you know, if you're if you come from a financially limited background and you have to take out student loans to pay for education, and then you end up getting some like degree in like I don't know, um, gender studies, yeah, and then like you end up serving coffee at Starbucks, which is not I'm not you know disparaging Starbucks or serving coffee, but that's not exactly what you wanted to do, right? It's not why you want to go. You you don't have 
college debt of one hundred, one hundred fifty thousand dollars to go serve coffee at Starbucks. That's not, I'm sure, nobody's life plan. But I think there has to be an honest conversation regarding higher education now, you know, and how it's very limiting to, uh, you know, kids, you know, and how they're using these universities as a way to indoctrinate these these kids into more of a socialist, you know, leftist type of thinking. And it's because of, uh, a lot of the professors that are there are the same professors that were activists back in the 70s and 60s that have now grown, grown older and now are in these universities uh, and they have as much gray hair as I do. So they have that, that persona of, you know, having lived through certain periods and wisdom. So there's nobody there at the universities to refute them, right? I would love to be, in, you know, to be invited to college campuses to basically refute any talking points that any uh, professor may have regarding, you know, history. I'm a huge bit history buff too. Uh, about that, about you know, you know, society and, and human behavior, but they'll never invite someone like myself or anybody that I know in my social circle because they know that there's no, there's no talking point, you know, that they can bring up and say like this is valid because everything that they say is all theoretical, and everything that they're talking and teaching about in these universities has been tried already, you know, and it's been tried throughout society uh, for the past hundred years at least, you know, with communism, socialism. Right. And the, the system that works is something that is more akin to capitalism, mm -hmm. you know, and having a society that's moral, morally based. Right. And having uh, a moral compass to tell society like, OK, this is where we have to draw the line, say this is wrong. This is right. Right. And we have a huge um, disconnect with that right now. We blur the line of morality between what is actually right, and which is wrong. You know? I think with the college stuff, the idea of economic independence and entrepreneurship it's empowering to men and mm -hmm. women. Like for me, I, I remember I had my first college job or post-college job and I saw the nine to five structure and, and I was like, wait, I'm realizing how impossible it is to maintain this idea of the boss babe when I'm able to see all these women in the company at different stages of life and just how much they're struggling right. to maintain and how, to be honest, deeply unhappy they were in certain circumstances. Mm -hmm. And I saw myself in that and I said, well, how can I achieve my family goals and dreams and maintain this at the same time and why did they tell me that I could in the first place why is that normalized and so that's when I started looking into how I could participate and become an asset to my family one day and look mm -hmm. into passive income like getting a house and maybe renting it out or mm -hmm. something like that yeah that way I can be at home or, or doing things like contracting work or having a small business that I have and I think it's insane that we don't try and actually empower people whether it's young men or young women and then we tell them straight up lies that they will feel good if they follow these policies. Mm -hmm. And that's just another one of the hard conversations that we have to have. Mm -hmm. The effectiveness of college, the usefulness of it, and then actually creating a life plan and a vision, what's mm -hmm. going to lead to true fulfillment. Yeah. So I think that it's the left's attack on, on so much. And I, I even mean like the inside, the heart, the mind of an average young person. And we're creating a lot of really sad people. Um, let's go back though, because we kind of okay. left off on your story. Sure. So, your grandfather really experienced the war, you said. And right. What happened from there where you guys made the transition to West Germany and, and back to America? Well, um, my my father and my mother met in West Germany. Okay. Right? So um, my father's side of the family, they grew up in um, Tokyo okay. during the war. Uh, and my my father was born in Tokyo. So um, there's there's a lot of things in history, I think, that, that gets... Um, uh, I guess it's good. I mean, it's not a clear black and white. Like if you talk to people from Taiwan, they'll tell you like the Japanese treated them better than the Kuomintang, which is the, the party that came over from China. Okay. Right. And then you talk to certain Koreans, they'll say like, yeah, the Japanese were better than the South Korean, North Koreans that ended up taking over. Um, but yeah, um, they basically met in Germany, but um, my, my grandfather from my father's side sold all of his businesses in, in Japan and moved back to Korea. And that's where, you know, um, he was going to basically, you know, start anew again. Mm -hmm. And then the Korean War broke out. Um, but then, like, a lot of them, you know, they migrated to the south because the north was you know, invading from, uh, you know, North Korea. And they were pushing back, you know, uh, pushing the South Korean army at that time was, like, not really an army at all. I mean, they had the U.S. backing. Uh, it was the U.S. army that basically held, you know, the security forces in South Korea. So they were being pushed back. But after the war is when... Um, I guess, uh, like a lot of the immigration started, you know, they started moving to Germany. There's a huge Korean population in, in Europe. Interesting. Yeah. In Germany, Amsterdam, uh, they have this one, um, 
they all get together in August. I don't know the date off my head, top of my head. I should because it's Korean Independence Day. But they meet, they meet in August at this huge festival, and I was there when I was in Germany. Um, and they get together and they basically, you know, reminisce about like their in, in the independence and they just celebrate it. The war itself um, with my parents, I mean, it was mainly on my mom's side of the family where he, you know, my father and my grandfather had that position, that leadership, leadership position. They're actually going after him and he had to really um, run from the North Koreans. Wow. Uh, and they actually had to go down you know, further to the south. And at that point, um, they didn't know what was going to happen because the, the war looked like it was going to, you know, encompass all of Korea. You know, it looked like uh, once the Chinese got involved and they pushed down and then, you know, um, there, I guess if you look at the map of Korea, Korea is a peninsula. Uh, it was only like in Busan where they were the American forces, UN forces and South Korean forces were. were. Uh, and it was only until they did the Incheon landing, which is when they went around and they basically were able to push the North back. But it looked like the war was going to be lost. It looked like all of Korea was going to become, you know, communist. But yeah, it was a struggle for them um, in terms of not only leaving their, their homes, but trying to adjust to basically the new area. I mean, just because you're in Korea doesn't mean like, it's like um, if there's a war in Florida or in California and all the Californians decide to move, move to Arizona or to Washington, yeah. not, not everyone's going to get situated very easily because it's a whole different state, a whole different, you don't, you don't really know people. Yeah. So it's the same thing. It's just because it's Korea doesn't mean like everyone knows everybody. Everyone's still, you know, living their lives and they have different provinces and districts. So, mm. yeah, but it was, um, it was a difficult time. And the, the few stories that I gathered from them was um, just a lot of running and hiding you know, and being persecuted in the beginning. And then stories of basically um, North Korean army uh, having like people sign uh, like a, 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 like I guess you can kind of call it like an allegiance letter saying that they're aligned with the North Koreans in order for them to receive rice and food. And then when the war flipped the other way and the South Korean army came and they found these lists and these people that signed these lists were, were basically deemed as uh, traitors and communists, and even though they were just doing it for survival, I think. And that's like the story of every war, right? I mean, it's it's the people that get caught in the middle that have to, that don't have an allegiance one way or another, uh, that don't have any sort of you know skin in the game, right? But they're just trying to survive and you know provide for their family. So they'll do things out of desperation, which and later the tide of war changes, comes back to haunt them. So stories like that. Yeah. No, I little nerd history thing, maybe you appreciate. That's what I like about the Federalist Papers, the Anti-Federalist Papers, where they're talking about should we form a union or not? Mm -hmm. And when they go through all of human history and explain like, listen, if we don't form a union, all the little states are gonna start fighting with each other because humans will go to war with each other yeah. over some really frivolous things, some serious things, mm -hmm. but for a lot of situations, it's very frivolous. And maybe you gain a little ground and then you get pushed back and gain a little ground, but those are always gonna happen and who really suffers are the pe the average everyday people. Right. They're the ones who hurt, they're the ones who get, you know, their villages raped and pillaged and it's traumatizing for the average people. So looking at all of human history and then looking at what we have in a country like America, it's, it's easy to be like, wow, I'm really thankful that we have this. Mm -hmm. And I, I truly think the ability to have comparative history and understanding of that leads to so many solutions that we could have for our country. It's, I think that's all rooted in that, the yeah. ability to understand the world around us versus what we have here. Because yeah, mm -hmm. we have problems, but geez, compared to what other people go through, it's it's really nothing. No, we, we have what I call first world problems. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I mean, we really don't have any problems here. Yeah. I mean, except for a small minority that's being very vocal, you know, saying that we have problems. I think too, I'm getting philosophical here, but I have this little thought in my head that in most situations, like what your grandfather had said of constantly having to move and shift and just be alive, it usually is the human's purpose. Man and women have their own roles in the unit mm -hmm. of keeping the family alive, fed, stable, and right. safe, like with a roof over their heads at night, able to just survive from day to day. And because that primal need for us and that purpose was taken away because we just can go about our day like yeah. this now, we feel almost empty. And if you don't find purpose in life, whether that's like service or doing charity work or being actively involved mm -hmm. in your community, you just feel empty on the inside. And, and the then not suffer. only that, they say, don't have kids, don't get married, don't do X, Y, Z. And so you've removed almost every, now right. and religion, you've removed every natural source of purpose and happiness and fulfillment. Mm -hmm. And the kids suffer. Exactly. Yeah, I grew up as a latchkey kid. And um, like my parents worked at the store, oh, okay. so I, would, I had a key, 
like with the string around my neck and open the door and get in and you know call my dad you know my mom say hey i'm, I'm home now and what do you do homework and after i hang up i turn on the tv and watch like cartoons and stuff right until they come home and then i'll you know i was a pretty smart kid you know I, I was in a highly gifted program so i was knocking out my homework pretty quickly like in like with less than an hour mm -hmm. like 30 minutes and the rest of the time i'm watching tv but yeah the kids suffer you know and i see that firsthand with um parents that are dual income and they have like you know um, jobs that are careers that are very demanding you know and they lose touch with their kids and and there's a lot of stories like that I've met people that are my age that have kids that are much older than me. I had kids later but I have, I have friends who have kids uh, that you know are much older than are in college right now and their one regret was not spending enough time with them you know and uh, they basically were off doing their thing you know you know promoting their career um, you know and basically they didn't have conversations with their kids or they thought they, thought they did, right? They were like, oh, we'll go on that family vacation and that'll connect me with the kids. But it's not like that. You gotta do it on a daily basis, yeah. you know? And it's I remember, yeah. And I remember the best time in my life with my mom was when my brother was born because she was forced to stay home really? and take care of my brother. And we're eight years apart. And um, when she was home and I came home from school, that was like the best, you know, cause my mom was there and she'd make me something to eat, you know, keep me on track, make sure I do my homework and then uh, do other things as well, but I wasn't all like left to my own devices, right? And even though that sounds great because you have your freedom, but just having your mom there and just having someone there, a parental figure, you can, it can be your dad as well yeah. or whoever. I actually had a better relationship with my mom and my dad. My dad was really tough, but <laughs> but just having her was, was great. And that's what made me realize as a parent that um, having like a mom at home, right? Uh, or someone at home is is necessary. You need that. and and. The kids need that. You can't just take them from school, drop them off at some, you know, after school program and then pick them up around like six, seven o'clock in the evening and then come home and have dinner and then have that short conversation and rinse and repeat for the rest, for the rest of the five days. And then you have the weekend where you're going to really connect with them, which you're probably not because you're going to do work on your home or do other things or go play golf or do something like that. Mm -hmm. So the kids are neglected. And I think that's by design, you know, from what, what I've, you know, been able to surmise based upon just living in America for so long. I, I think it's by design, you know, because they want to, um, they want to get the kids early. They want they 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 want to have influence over your kids early enough where basically by the time they get to a certain age, like whatever you tell them just falls on deaf ears. Like it, it, you're not going to matter anymore. You yeah. Know? Well, that's why you know, it's it's interesting for me because I'm 25 and I came into it and I was like, I'm a feminist and I you know I just said the normal things. Mm -hmm. I read. Um, the feminine mystique when I was in high school and I had a little, to be honest, I had a little sticker of Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton on my bedroom wall in high school. It's no shame. And it was, I voted for Obama. I just thought, yeah, I, <laughs> I just thought they were so cool. It was like a picture of them in college. And I was right. like, oh, they're so cool and hip. And, yeah. and I remember they, you know, they just been, it'd been normalized that they were good figures. And then Hillary Clinton came and spoke at a bookstore. She was doing a book signing in my hometown. And I told my mom I was going to go. And she was like, honey, let me tell you a little something about this thing called Benghazi. Mm. And that was the first kind of political conversation I had with my parents. But there's so much that's normalized for us. I mean, in the, the school system, for example, it's just normalized and taught that, you know, Department of Education at the federal level mm -hmm. is existing because it's not fair for some people to not have the funds that they deserve because they live in poor communities. And so that's why we have to have it because it's fair. And you never even question the fact that, wait, that's not supposed to be based on the constitution. Um, so you have to relearn these things almost. And that also plays into our expectations with family and with society. You have to kind of rethink everything. And I think a lot of people in my generation, a lot of young girls too, we were put through the system and now we're popped out of it and we're like, wait, now everybody has a lot of student debt and we're supposed to follow what timeline at this point. It's, it's almost like they've created chaos. Mm -hmm. And in this chaos, they can thrive. People that don't have fulfillment, their lives are chaotic. They have nothing to really attach them to. And part of unlearning some of this stuff was that I thought it would be empowering. And you even see more conservative people sometimes talk about, we need to support families mm -hmm. and have pro-family policy by creating things like government provided, pre-K and daycare so that women can get in the workplace and be empowered. Mm -hmm. And the more and more people I interview like you, they talk about how in their country, one of the worst things that happened was this creation of mandated early age, preschool, 
pre-K and, and daycare for young children. Mm -hmm. And so before kindergarten even starts, they're going and mm -hmm. getting put into the system. It's very strange. Um, so I'm kind of curious. So you called it a latchkey mm -hmm. kid. What was that like? So how did you guys get from West Germany and then start a small business? What kind of business was it? When we came from Germany, West Germany to here, um, to LA, we lived around like the Pico Union area. Uh -huh. uh, and then um, my, my father had to borrow money from my grandfather to buy the, uh, his first store, which is in Boyle Heights. Uh, but before that, he took odd jobs as painting and, you know, painter as a painter. My mom was still uh, working as a nurse. So she was a, a LVN, licensed vocational nurse. So she was doing that. And then once they bought the store, you know, after they borrowed money from my grandfather is when, you know, the whole family started working there. Um, and then we had that store in the 70s. So through the 70s, and then um, we had another store in Huntington Park, which is another um, um, uh, city in LA, south LA, in, near the southern part of LA. And uh, we had that for, until uh, about like the mid 80s, you know, and then he sold everything. And then he ended up having a pool cleaning service that he started. Um, you know, from that point on. So during the riots, I mean, we didn't have any skin in the game. Uh, so it's not like we had a store or anything. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up getting involved because one, uh, one of my friends, his brother had a, a stereo shop back in the day, back in the 90s. This is where, um, like, you can take your car and get it tricked out. You know, remember, uh, pimp my ride. This yeah. is way before that. <laughs> this is where you can uh, install like huge, big box speakers and put an amp and all that. So he had one mm -hmm. of those stores, um, and then. He, when you saw the fires and that's when he called and he was like, hey, like, I, you know, I, they're, they're burning places down. Like, you know, can I pick you up? And um, I was like, yeah, come get me. You know, so that's when we ended up going out. But um, yeah, it was it wasn't like we had uh, any stores or anything like that. It was basically just uh, going out. And my father did the same thing. Um, I, I left with my shotgun. I, I bought my first first paycheck I got. I, I bought a shotgun. It was a Remington 870 pump action shotgun. I bought that and I was like, it's the first thing I want to buy. And I took that out. And um, so my friend was the driver. I was basically sitting shotgun with the shotgun. Uh, and then my father left and he had a, a 38 special. So he took that. And it's not like now where like everyone's connected through social media and you're all talking and everyone's connected. Back then it was just like you had all these little different groups. And the call went out through the Korean uh, radio station saying like, hey, like they're burning places down. So if you can help, come help. You know, so a lot of, uh, not a lot, I'm say some Korean men, a lot of the older Korean guys. I'm, I'm like the youngest in my generation from that group. You were like 19, right? Yeah, I was okay. 19. So uh, we were like the younger guys. And the older guys were the ones on the roof that you saw. Uh, the younger guys, like uh, from what I know, I was my, it was myself and uh, my, my buddy. And there was like another group um, that I read about later. You know, that basically they were mistaken for looters and they were actually uh, fired upon. And uh, one of the guys, um, his name is Eddie Kim, lost his life uh, through friendly fire. Wow. Um, but yeah, we were the younger guys and we were the ones that were right, basically riding around, um, you know, patrol. And yeah. um, Well, know. so let's provide some context. So going back, mm -hmm. I think it's, it's interesting and kind of sweet that you said you didn't have skin in the game, but you grew up in a small business family. Mm -hmm. And I can, you know, I wasn't around then, but when I saw the 2020 riots and I saw small businesses being burned, I was horrified because mm -hmm. like I have a small business and I know just how much it costs to buy every single piece of machine qu right. equipment yep. in that thing, all the supplies, mm -hmm. all of the work that was maybe packaged up and ready to get sent out, just all of the years that it takes to create, maybe it looks a little messy in the workshop, but it took a lot of years to acquire all of that mess. Yeah. And I can't imagine someone coming and it's just all burned down one day. And the left's reaction was to say, even national politicians, well, your property is not as important as fighting for justice. Right. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. These people don't understand entrepreneurship or building something or especially your family relying on that small business. And so they say, well, you have insurance. Don't worry. They don't have anything in their head that can make them feel compassionate for the idea that they just ruined a family dream yeah. that was built up. So I feel like y you did have skin in the game almost because you understood what it meant to see other people's businesses being burned. Mm -hmm. Is Can you talk about the lead up to it? Like, let's talk about what happened where there was a similar situation of a shooting, mm -hmm. a police shooting, right? A black man dies and the left, the race driven radical left, just like they did in 2020, this time in 1992, before mm -hmm. this ever happened with, with George Floyd, they did the same behavior. Right. They were unhappy with the verdict. 
they did the same repeated tactics and they ended up burning, looting, and destroying neighborhoods, right. specifically Koreatown, right? Yeah. So there was um, actually another incident before Rodney King, which okay. is Latasha Harlins. Oh, yeah, okay. She was shot by a, uh, an older Korean shopkeeper. Okay. Right? And, oh, yes, okay. And that became a huge point. And then um, at her court hearing, the, the judge gave her, you know, house arrest for, I guess, a few years. And uh, the black community was really outraged by that. Yeah. But, but they the video only, came out. I saw that video. Yeah, the video the, the video they showed on the network news only was a portion of, not the whole video, of yep. what really happened. Mm -hmm. So that's how they sold it. And interestingly enough, uh, Maxine Waters, the congresswoman we have, mm -hmm. was the same congresswoman we had back then. You're kidding. No, I'm not. I didn't know that. Uh, you know, I'm talking about like, you talk about Maxine Waters, uh, Al Sharpton, uh, Jesse Jackson. All these guys have been around since like the 60s talking about, you know, we need, need race, equality, this and that. Like, what have they been doing all this time? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it's been like decades. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to tell me like basically you weren't able to solve this problem or get, I mean, we even had a black president at one point, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you can't tell me like we weren't, we weren't able to figure this whole thing out by now. You must be bad at your... Position. Yeah, it must be so bad that they're making so much money off of it, right? Yeah, I mean, that's yeah. what it is. I mean, they're basically making money off of this, and they're making money off the black community. But anyway, uh, Latasha Arlins was shot, and that became a huge uproar in the black community. But there was already tension between the Korean community and the black community just because of the cultural differences. Okay. So you had a lot of Koreans that came here that had a higher education, like went to university in Korea, that came here, and, you know, the only, you know, um, avenue that they can see in terms of uh, making money was basically to open a shop. And it wasn't in the best of neighborhoods. It was like in South Central, South LA, and those neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And um, because of the cultural differences, a lot of times, uh, even small things like handing out change when you're giving change, um, like in Korean culture, it's it's respectful to hand someone money in their hand versus just kind of tossing it on the counter. Oh, okay. So those slights. That'd be nice. Let's those, bring that back. Yeah. Well, yeah. But those misconceived slights was kind of what kind of, oh, kind I of see what you mean. like fermented like the, the animosity between the two groups. And then with Rodney King, which the guy who was high on, you know, PCP, uh, and he was racing through South LA and up to, you know, Altadena. And when he finally got, you know, when he, when he was stopped and they basically, he wouldn't comply. And I mean, they beat the guy, right? Um, they should have pepper sprayed him or tased him. They didn't have the technology back then, but it looked bad too, you know? So that's what kind of set everything off. And the verdict came down. And that's when the whole Florence and Normandy, uh, and there was a uh, guy, Reginald Denny, the truck driver, who was basically taken out of his truck and beaten, right? Um, and all that occurred, right? But It's similar tactics. I mean, people were scared to drive around in 2020 because mm -hmm. they were ripping people out of vehicles. They they were jumping. Do you remember the 911 call of the mom saying, they're jumping on my car, please help me? And the 911 operator is saying, sorry, ma'am, this Did is you know a sanctioned event. Did you know in 2020 that Koreatown wasn't touched? Like nobody went into Koreatown. Really? Yeah. It was like basically you had the riots in like Hollywood. They knew not to do it again. Yeah. And they, they were going to go ahead because they knew that. I mean, personally, if the call went out again, I mean, I'd be down there again. You yeah. Know? And I've you know, talked to other Korean Americans and they felt the same way. A lot of them, younger guys now, right? Younger guys were saying like, yeah, we would have gone down too. So was the tension growing at this point? What was happening for you guys and your friends? Were you keeping an eye on everything? Were you noticing the tension that was growing? Well, and you guys like were prepared? 19 years old. I mean, what do I know at 19? I yeah. mean, I, at 19, I dropped out of high school. You know, <laughs> I ended up working at, in, in um, a car dealership selling cars, right? I wasn't going to go to college. You know, I was I was basically rebellious. You know, I had a huge riff with my father and we didn't really talk and do, do much and stuff like that. So um, it, it, none of that really occurred to me, right? All we saw was basically what was happening on TV. And then I was driving back from Hollywood to uh, Alhambra, which is where I work. And um, you can see the fires and you can smell the smoke when you're on the freeway, you know, as you're driving, you can see it, you know, on to your left, because that's where downtown LA was and South LA was. But for the rest of the people that lived in Southern California, especially like in the suburbs, it was like, like uh, my wife lived in Cerritos, which is a suburb uh, of LA, like on the border with Orange County. And she said it would just look like a movie because it was just happening on TV, but there was nothing happening around her neighborhood. Oh, okay. So there was like a huge disconnect with everybody else that wasn't connected with that community. Yeah. Right. And saw what was going on. If you lived in the surrounding area, you saw it happening. Right. Uh, but for everybody else, it was just like, uh, you know, it was just like a channel flipper. You know, you flip your channel. Did they, so did they specifically target Koreatown with their anger? Was that what was happening? Or how did it end up being Koreatown that was getting burned and attacked? Well, it was that, you know. So there was animosity between the black community and the Korean community. Um, 
but just in general, it's like um, they saw that as an opportunity to basically take back or, or to kind of um, express their frustration. Yeah, right? kind of attack the little guy. Yeah, attack the little guy, you know, and not only that, but this is the, one of the first instances where they were actually shooting at firefighters, right? So firefighters are trying to put out the flames, we're getting shot at. You're kidding. Right? So they needed a police escort, and that's another reason why uh, the police stood down at that time. At that time, Daryl Gates was the chief of police. Yeah, they're all uh, getting attacked, right? Right, okay. and then um, uh, Tom Bradley was the mayor. I love that guy. I was a really good mayor. I, yeah. I thought Tom was a really great mayor, but um, yeah, they had to stand down. And and I, as as old as I am now, and looking back at the events, I don't blame them for that. Yeah. Because you had one police officer for every like what fifteen twenty people that are out there, and you know police officers, they want to go home to their families, right? I mean, Interesting. they're not going to put their lives on risk for like a store or store owner okay. or for, you know, someone I've, who's I've heard a bunch of perspectives on it. So it wasn't that they were like, we hate the Koreans, we're not protecting Koreatown. Okay. It was a matter of opportunity. Okay. That's what it was. I mean, it could, you you had um, like Hispanic, like this doesn't kept talked about Hispanic owned businesses that were, that were alluded. You had black owned, some black owned businesses that were alluded. And it was just a matter of opportunity. It's like, you had no more law and order, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it's just total chaos. It's a free for all. Do what you do as you will, right? So you can go and loot and burn and whatever you want to do. So um, yeah, it wasn't out of necessity. It's not like these people needed these things, right? Yeah. I mean, you well, know, it's like when they invaded Nike and yeah. AOC was like, right. they are trying to put bread on the table right. by taking Nike, right? One hundred twenty dollars <laughs> Nike shoes and stuff. I mean, so that's the thing, though, and that's people laugh at it and they mm -hmm. say, "Oh, she's so dumb." I'm like, "No, no, 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 no." She's so conniving and mm -hmm. strategic, mm -hmm. and this dilutes this kind of behavior into right. nothingness, and now it's acceptable. Mm. Um, so this was happening. You said they had a cor Korean radio? That's how you yeah. guys coordinated? Yeah, it, it was a Korean radio that basically was, was broadcasting what was happening. Okay. And at one point, they basically sent out uh, you know, uh, an SOS saying, like, look, if, if you can help, come down here and help, you know, or whatever you can do. And that's when I guess um, a lot of the Koreans that lived in the suburbs, some of them came down, you know, and they connected with some of the community, the friends, you know, because everyone had like small cliques of circles of friends mm -hmm. that they had. So everyone connected with their friends uh, and then basically started like just um, strategically parking their cars in a way where it wouldn't let oncoming traffic, you know, it would impede the flow of oncoming traffic. And they did that purposely because a lot of the gangs that were there uh, in that neighborhood, um, that they basically took pot shots at the Korean shop owners. And it was, it wasn't just because- Just randomly shooting? Yeah, because it was just like fun to do. You know, the mentality wasn't like, hey, we want to kill you. It was just like, you know, we can do whatever we want. Let's just take some pot shots at these guys. Humans are strange. Humans are pretty bad, you know, left to their own devices. If they're just given free will, I mean, it's just, and and the thing is like, um, because I grew up in like gang culture, you know, growing up in LA, like I knew the mentality of that. You know, and it wasn't anything like they're, you know, it's because these guys are Koreans. It has nothing. It's just like, it's a way to blow off steam, I guess, for them, you know, and to basically just have some fun. You know, that's what they consider fun. So that's what kind of like, you know, upset me and a lot of like, uh, you know, my friend, you know, when we were young, you know, as we were younger. So that's what gave us, I guess, the reason to get on, get yeah. in the car and start running patrols. Now, were people getting hit and dying? Or were people injured by these pot shots? No, good thing they are all like, uh -huh. nobody goes to this range and okay. practices, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's one of the pluses of these yeah. boys with their right. ridiculous guns. Uh, so what was the structure like though? So one of the first things is they started to park the cars to protect the roads yeah. from people getting in. What right. were some of the other first basic things? Just basically that. Okay. It was basically to cordon off the, the streets, okay. like the main streets, and then to make sure like you, you impede traffic. So so the, my, well, I'm confused though. So like the, the older guys go on the roof mm -hmm. and then the younger guys are in the cars going around right. with your friends? Right. Why so, was that? Well, because like I grew up with a lot of gangs, so I knew where their neighborhoods were. So we would basically roll into their neighborhood you know, and basically, you know, they'd be out there washing their car or something and we'd basically roll up and I'd basically pull out my shotgun and just look at them and then we just kind of roll on by just to kind of put them on notice, letting them know like, hey man, uh, you come back, it's not going to be just you shooting at, at us. It's going to be different because now not only are the older guys going to be shooting at you, but now we're, we have wheels and yeah. we're mobile and we'll be coming after you guys too. It's like criminals. I mean, they look for easy prey, yeah. you know, opportunity. And then you, once you decide to fight back, you know, or hit back. I mean, that's when you know, they kind of wise up and yeah. 
they start weighing their chances of like, can I get away with this or not? Okay, and so I heard too, the, the guys posted on the top, on the roofs, that was to basically just protect the businesses mm -hmm. it, and provide that presence, almost like you said, make yeah. it clear it's not an easy target anymore. Right. And so they're up there. I heard that the gun shops owned by Koreans, they were starting to just hand out That's firearms. True. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, there's a gun shop that was on Western and uh, between 8th and 9th Street. And um, I, I don't think it's there anymore, but they basically were giving out firearms with a box of ammunition. Um, just saying like, listen, just take this and then settle it up, bring it back when all, all this dies down. Yeah. So a lot of us were anticipating that this was going to go on for a while. We were expecting it might go on for like the next week or two, um, but thankfully it didn't. Yeah. Because uh, the national um, the National Guard showed up on that weekend. You know, oh, wow. And, yeah. Okay. So that all happened. Um, do you have any stories of like what that was like? I mean, were you guys coordinating with the guys on the roofs or how did you go about that day on Friday? Grace, we're doing a team tour. Okay, we're ready to go. So now we're slowly heading into the southern part of Koreatown, which uh, for me, it kind of starts where the 10 freeway is. Okay. So where the 10 freeway is, like I would call that kind of the southern border of Koreatown. Ooh. I used to come up here with my wife when we were like undergrads and go shopping. We used to go to the clubs. That's um, so interesting. How quickly eat. did it take to snap back from being all torn down? Probably within the week. Really? Like, the week. Yeah, because we went out. Um, the verdict came down on Wednesday. And then things started popping off on Wednesday evening. And then it got really bad on Thursday. And then the call went out on uh, Thursday, like Thursday late afternoon. And that's when they were like, yeah, you know, we need help. And then it was on Friday when everybody just, you know, went down. Like anybody who had a firearm at that point or wanted to get involved, um, took off, went south. So a lot of the Koreans that live here now, um, they moved out of the area to different suburbs. Mm -hmm. But back then, they didn't live that far from Koreatown. So, like my buddy who has the stereo shop mm -hmm. that, that his brother, older brother um, managed with uh, a few other partners, like that was like down here. So a lot of the, the early immigrants that came to, came to LA, they worked in Koreatown, but they ended up buying places just kind of outside of Koreatown. Mm -hmm. um, and then eventually everyone started moving further out, further out to the suburbs. I see. Like a lot of uh, places in LA, they have these indoor swap meets. So a lot of the Koreans, they s set up stalls in those places and they basically kind of uh, did business not that far from where they live. So if they lived in this area, they usually had probably a, a stall in one of the uh, swap meets. Okay. And like oh, these guys are totally illegal. Oh yeah. Are these, these small businesses? These, yeah, these are totally illegal. They just, no, set up they just set up shop here and yeah, they'll sell whatever. Oh wow. So like. Yeah, it's yeah, fascinating. It's a, it's a whole different economy. You got the one that's like <laughs> the like... legit economy, and then you got the one that's right here on the street. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh, those are power tools. Yes, indeed. You can find anything here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay, so we are in Sorry. Koreatown right so, now? So yeah, so now we're going into Koreatown. So this is Vermont, and then we'll go up to, uh, I think it's 1803. That's where um, the stair shop was. Okay. And then you'll see the building. There's a roll-up door where there's a driveway. So they used to pull the cars in there and they used to work on the cars. And then right next to that was the mechanic shop. So it worked out well because they can have a few things done. Yeah. So what they did was um, at that time when we rolled up, it was like eight in the morning. Um, they were moving a lot of the merchandise that they had because back then people would put like these huge speakers in the trunk. Yeah. So they would move all that away from the window and they were like boarding up the windows. And they had Hispanic and black workers that were there. They were there early too, and they're already like helping move the merchandise away from the main windows and they're boarding them up. Jeez. Okay, so was that the same area that you were frequenting when you were that age, when you were young, just hanging out? Mm, I hung up uh, further north. So this is where it was. This is where we started. So you have the, the driveway. Uh -huh. It goes in, the roll up door goes in there. And then from there, you basically, you know, work on several cars. Then the, the mechanic shop was next door. But all the, the windows there, I mean, they have bars on them now, but back then um, they basically, I don't think, yeah, I think they still had bars back then too, but they boarded everything up. A lot of the, the shooting that we heard, the gunshots were coming up from north, up north. Mm -hmm. So what they did is uh, the old, um, my friend's older brother sent us up north. He goes, go check out the guys that are up, up north. 
and see what's going on because they heard a lot of gunshots even early in the morning like they were, we, we heard them coming down too so he sent us up to uh olympic and vermont and this is where um we're gonna hang a left and that's where the, the plaza is where the guy was shooting yeah interesting so. and it was pretty chaotic right i mean mm -hmm. you didn't really know what was happening what was the general vibe because this is quite a big community to yeah. go out were people feeling really unsafe did you not know what was going to happen next pretty much especially everybody has a firearm and it's just shooting randomly yeah but this was the 90s so there were people were shooting anyway like, <laughs> this was, was the 90s it was like there was like people had big boom boxes in their cars and yeah. people were shooting everywhere. well you know the whole concept of drive-by shooting started like in the late 80s 90s oh okay yeah that, that's when um like a lot of the drugs went into the inner cities like crack you know, and that became very profitable for some of the gangs in the inner city. So they ended up basically setting up businesses and oh. started shooting their rivals. But all this, like Pico, Vermont, this was, um, this was, I think this belonged to eight, a gang called 18th Street. And they were the, um, the predominant gang that was here in LA. Uh, from the, they, I think they started like in the 60s or 50s, 50s mm -hmm. or 60s, and they were predominantly uh, Mexican Americans that were here. And then the the rivals that came in were from El Salvador. Oh. And they were uh, Mount, you know, MS-13. They're yeah. called Ma Mara Salvatrucha. Mm -hmm. uh, they basically they moved in up north, towards like Eighth, Ninth Street, in that in that area. Okay. And they became their rival, and then that's where a lot of the shootings happened. So this is kind of like the heart of Koreatown, Olympic and Vermont. Okay. Just Olympic is the main street that runs through Koreatown. Now, so were you driving around this area when mm -hmm. you were, you remember you told me about the radio? Was that playing as everybody's driving around or can you tell me a little bit about that? No, it's, it, well, it's not like we had it playing and yeah. it's not like anybody's coordinating. Okay. And cell phones were still like the brick type. Right? Yeah. So nobody really had it in many of, a lot of those. Everyone still had pagers. Okay. So it was just basically going from one area to another. And luckily it was just me and my buddy. So it was easy for us to approach them because, you know, it didn't look like there was a carload of us. Yeah. And then, um, like, we didn't have tinted windows. So this is the plaza. Actually, let's go into it. Okay. Yeah, so this fence, they put it up <laughs> after the, after the, after the whole, oh, wow. uh, yeah, after the incident. So this went up. But before that, this was all open. I'm curious, do people who experienced it ever talk about it or reference it? Or is um, it just something that happened in the past that people kind of forget about? I think it's something that people kind of forget about because it's not like like the whole Korean community came out. It was just some of us, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and the ones that did come out, the ones that you see in the pictures, those guys are getting old and they're passing away. Yeah. Right. So I'm actually considered like the oldest, you know, but I was like the youngest at that time. But it's not anything that's talked about. I mean, no. it, it was, it was. It was impactful enough for many of us to remember, but it didn't go long enough for it to have like a an effect in terms of like just the the psyche of the community. Yeah, right? that's so interesting, and I love now that we're we're going back to it and we're trying to remember what even happened back then. And you mm -hmm. saw the rise of those rooftop Korean memes that I told you about. Do you feel like that's changed a lot since back then? I mean, like the masculine men of the community, from what my perspective is of Koreatown, the masculine mm -hmm. men stood up and said our community's not being protected by the people that are supposed to be doing it so we're going to step up do you feel like that's not a thing that would happen in most areas of the country anymore I, that's hard to answer I, I mean i mean culturally we're so different now you know? yeah i mean i look at a lot of the the people that are like in your age bracket and i just you know in korean there's this thing called it's a word called koseng which means struggle and for a lot of koreans that 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 word means um uh, it has a deeper meaning because it basically means that you develop character from it, mm -hmm. right? And I think that's where a lot of the identity from Korean Americans comes from, from this community. Wow. Because a lot of them immigrated here and they came with nothing, really. Like, And a lot of them were well-educated, too. So we went through these smaller streets and there was actually, I don't know, it's the same building, but there was a, um, it was a small complex that we drove past. There were like three guys that were washing their car and they were, back then, we kind of knew how everybody dressed. I mean, they wore kind of their colors. Yeah. Yeah, like we had white t-shirt with jeans. Uh, and then we just pulled up and I just flashed my shotgun. And as we drove by, and then I think it, I want to say it was like around here. I don't know if it's this or, yeah. But we, we basically just flashed my shotgun and my friend flashes nine and then we just kind of cruised by them. And, you know, it yeah. was basically just to kind of get the message out there. It sounds like 
completely different times. Yeah, that that we were out out and about, and then that was on that was on Friday. So Friday is when everything started to kind of die die down a bit, and then National Guard came out on that the following day on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. So. Now, what do you think? Because a lot of people are criticizing that during 2020 when we saw the new round of race riots come, we mm-hmm. should have seen our leaders step up and send National Guard sooner. Do you think? that the LA riots from 1992 were a good example of that, of how things quickly stopped once enforcement came? Right, yeah, it is. Yeah. I mean, it's a no brainer. It I seems mean, common sense. It is, but I think maybe they're pushing a, uh, an agenda. Well, actually, I, Ali sent me some numbers mm-hmm. that I wanted to read because they were crazy. And to think that leaders that were in office during this were okay with allowing a new round of them to happen again in 2020. It says 60 people died in the 1992 riots, 10 were shot by police, 2,000 were injured, 12,000 were arrested, $1 billion in damage, including $500 million of damage in Koreatown. 4,000 National Guard troops deployed. The riots ended May 4th. Now, if they knew that that's how damaging things could be, for them to understand and then promote that kind of behavior just a couple decades later, Mm -hmm. it really kind of disgusts me. Yeah. So Maxine Waters has been in office 30 years, saw it in 1992, now in 2020 was promoting that same kind of violence, knowing it could be a billion dollars in damage, Mm -hmm. thousands of people injured. Right. See, that's that historic context. Mm -hmm. It's been erased because you don't know anything about that based on what you learn in school these days. No. And that's why we're doing this. Mm -hmm. Just a little fun addition. Right. Thank you for doing that. It's because it's not a lesson in school. No, it's it's nothing they'll teach in school. Have you tried? That's the thing is I I wanted to do this interview in Koreatown because Mm -hmm. I told I was researching with Allie and Grace. There's nothing on the internet. Regarding <laughs> There's barely anything about really? Koreatown, about the riots. There's a few videos, but literally two or three or four. Hmm. And so the more that we can add to the arsenal of just information, of tracking what happened, of the footage, the interviews as much as possible, mm-hmm. we're increasing that stock. So it's, I don't know if the, there's a plaza here. So I, pretty much we were uh, doing this all day. Okay. This was us from eight in the morning till about like when the sun was going down. Wow. And then uh, we went back to the shop and then um, uh, his older brother sent us out and we picked up food. You see this? <laughs> yeah, we're food just like go for it. What were you guys talking about in the plaza. car? Of like, oh, I hope we don't run into anything actually no, serious. No, we were like, man, like, wow, look at this. Like, the city's coming down. It's just like getting, yeah, it was in this plaza. Oh. And there was actually a, a, where the Pilates, I think there used to be a restaurant. Where am I? Oh, Oxford. Hang on. Let me oh, I gotta go with this one. Yeah, that used to be a restaurant. We went in there and picked up food, and everybody had like sidearms. They oh had my like gosh. the 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 shoulder holsters. Yeah. So everyone had sidearms and just was sitting down eating, and oh. and we're there like two kids picking up like to go order, right? So and it was just like it looked kind of normal, except for all the sidearms and everybody like you know being armed to the teeth. Yeah. That's funny. I mean, so was he also 19? That's crazy. Yeah. That must be fun. Brother. I mean, what a, a memory to so be this 19 is the years old. This is, this, oh. is, this is where they were. They were on top of this building. Oh, and it's abandoned? Yeah, it's been... <gasps> and the gun store was in this plaza. There was a gun store in this plaza that basically was giving away guns with ammo. So, yeah, the gun store was here. It's not here anymore, but... It used to be like one of these, either one of this one or that one. It's wow. Down this way more. And so did they just send out an alert or how did people start to get noticed? They just, they came in. Like everybody from the they surrounding like, shops went help? to the gun store like, hey, like I want to buy a gun. And like the owner was like, okay, forget the background check. Here you go. Oh my here gosh. Go. Here's, here's, so a, here's a did firearm. did law enforcement ever come into that store? Because nowadays Mm-mm. the full no. force of the law would come in and politicians would be like, you're done. And they would make an example of somebody that would do that. No, they didn't. And here's they another swap meet. Mm-hmm. This used to be a, like a supermarket, like a Ralph's or something. Oh. So they'll convert the inside into a swap meet. This is like your, you know, uh, one-stop shop for almost everything and anything. This is really cool. Thanks for suggesting that we come in here. Yeah. And how old are your kids? Uh, 13 and 11. So have you talked to them about any of So we talk about politics and obviously like, um, you know, with what I'm doing out there right now. So they know about Antifa, BLM, you know. Really? I mean, oh, you tell them about that Well, stuff. plus they, they came to our house. They vandalized my car. So uh-huh. that created the story of, you know, conversation of, you know, what, we, what I'm happen. doing, why that happens. Well, I think that's one of the lessons from all the interviews that I've done. 
is the kids in other countries are given so much responsibility and so much burden and stress in that way. And then here it's like, you really don't have to deal with no, a lot here. Really so a lot. even just having to deal with, oh yeah, those are protesters who right. got a little too aggressive. It's hard for us to even try and figure out how to explain that to American kids. Mm -hmm. But yeah. Because there's no struggle. There's, there's nothing to fight for. Well, I saw it too, it's that young men, especially on missions, mm -hmm. that's the most important thing that you can give them when they're in their adolescence and growing and coming of age. And they don't really have that right now. And so they're being manipulated into they are. bad right. missions. Yeah. Yeah, but this, this is the iconic building that everybody knows. That's cool. We drove by this building, but it's not like we were some like- guys up there. Yeah, they were probably up there. You know, because have you, if you go up there, it's really, it's a huge roof. Really? Yeah. How many guys do you think were on the roofs? Like dozens or hundreds? No, it's probably here. It's probably the guys that worked at the car dealership, right? So it's probably like eight, less than a dozen maybe. Yeah. So they're up there. And then like, this is just one place, right? And so when you were driving around with just your friend, were you worried about accidentally running into those other gangs? Not really. No? No, because I don't know, I, I wasn't, I wouldn't say I was scared. I think I was more doing a job. Yeah. I think that's probably the best way I can put it. I see. Now, I was kind of curious, we talked about it in the studio interview a little bit mm -hmm. of why the police didn't necessarily come to Koreatown to protect it when it was being more attacked than other areas. Mm -hmm. Can you refresh my memory on that? Like, do you think it was also a part of the fact that maybe they were just saying, uh, usual gang violence going on? No, or what was we it? just drove this. This is just part of Koreatown. Like yeah. it, all the the rest of the riots was also happening south of the 10 freeway. So they were So that's not technically Koreatown, but there was a lot of Korean owned businesses that were south of the 10 mm -hmm. that was, you know, being looted and burned. And um, they had their own drama down there. I mean, I didn't go down that way. So I didn't, I didn't know what was happening too much down that way, but I mean, this is a huge area to try to police. I yeah. mean, they didn't have enough officers to do that. And then when you have social chaos and breakdown and people are just running on, running amok, and I think a lot of officers that see that, that sees this, I mean, it's not really what they signed up for. I mean, what they signed up for was to stop the bad guy from stealing a car or yeah. breaking into someone's home. But when you have a mob of people that are just out and about and just getting chaotic, I mean, I think we all kind of default to a survival instinct. So in general, do you think it's pretty fun that the term rooftop Korean is becoming infamous at this point? I think it's funny. Yeah? <laughs> I think it's funny because, yeah, I, I, like I said, I didn't know anything about it up until like November of 2020 mm -hmm. when I created the, the Twitter account that I did. I, I had no idea there was a meme or anything like that. Was that term used until... Or was it just a new thing to call them rooftop Koreans? When did that get coined? Do you I know? know? I don't know. We've I mean, it, look that it, it didn't happen in the 90s. I yeah. mean, it, there was like a, a period where people kind of forgot about what happened. You yeah. Because, I mean, the, the last riots that we had in LA prior to the 92 riots was the Watts riots in the 60s, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, like me and everybody else were thinking like, this is probably gonna be the last time we see something like this, right? Because Rodney King was what, um, you know, it's not something that was, that, that we saw was gonna continue happening, right? With uh, the black community and just the circumstances of how he was apprehended and why he ran. Like, if you look at the details of that, I mean, you kind of understand why the cops felt, you know, like they had to do what they, you know, what they did. Mm -hmm. But we thought that was all gonna get, you know, um, we were gonna all move on from that. And it was all gonna be part of the past, but, so yeah, a lot of us were surprised what happened in 2020. Because I remember in 2020, I just kept seeing these things on the internet mm -hmm. of bring back the rooftop Koreans. And I, I said, the what? <laughs> it's like, what is that? Yeah, but this area still kind of looks the same. It's not the cleanest. It's really kind of gritty. You can tell like, you know, if you're an immigrant coming to this country for the first time, you're gonna open up a shop. It's gonna probably be in, in areas like this, right? And then get your kids to school, have them go through higher ed education and have them do something different than what you're doing. I love that section of, so you and your dad were both involved in this. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about what it was like as father and son to go out and do your own little missions? Oh, yeah, well, well I, I didn't really get along with my dad. I mean, I was kind of a bad kid growing up, so I put him through a lot of, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I basically, I mean, I was like one of the kids that always got into trouble, so 
Um, yeah, so when he left, I left around the same time he did. It was really early in the morning. Um, and he was taking out his handgun for the first time for, well, in a long while. He used to have that when we used to have a market like years before. Yeah. Uh, it was a 38 Special Snub Nose. And I only saw that gun a few times because it was, in, it was in the, at the market. And he used to keep it on top of this cabinet. But he actually took that out and I was going out with my shotgun. But I mean, we didn't really talk back then. I mean, uh, the relationship between Korean sons and their dads with that generation, it's, it's very, um, uh, it was a very strict type of relationship because they came over to this country back when um, Korea had a military dictatorship. So that culture kind of, you know, came with them to the States. So a lot of the kids, a lot of the sons that grew up, like, you know, I've, I've met some guys that were like my age too. And we talk about how our, our dads were very strict and kind of, uh, they, you know, their sons, they kind of like, um, they raised them in kind of like a military fashion, right? They were very strict in, in terms of how they put down the rules and what they wanted to see uh, with us. So I thought it was just me, but I, I found out it was just that generation. So there, there was, um, no real conversation, very stoic generation, um, you know, go through their own hardships, never talk about it, right? Uh, so when he was leaving and I was leaving at the same time, it's not like we had a lot of exchange of words. I just told him I was leaving with my friend and he knew my friend too. Um, so he was like, okay. And he knew what I was doing. Cause I mean, I'm walking out with a shotgun, like, you know, like a bag full of, you know, of shells. And then I'm walking out and he's walking out too. So, um, yeah, so it was not a lot of words exchanged at that point, but yeah. uh, like I knew where he was going. I, I didn't know who his friends were, you know, but yeah. he knew where I was going. But Did it's you guys like, ever get closer after that? Um, I think we got closer after I went to college, when yeah. I started going to college, because I was such a screw up of a kid mm -hmm. and I didn't go to college and, and that's what he wanted. He gave me options, he's either join the military, go to the police academy or go to college. And I was like, okay, I don't want people shooting at me anymore. <laughs> I've done that as a kid, so I want to do something that's a little bit more paper driven. So I went to college instead. So after that, that's when he felt better about yeah. me going to college and, you know, having a different life path than what I was doing before that. Yeah. Now I'm curious too, the, one of the biggest problems is young people now falling for the lies of leftism. What do you think about the connection between the rise of communism in Korea? and what that later translated into with Koreatown, with the 1992 riots, the mindset that people maybe had, the immigrants that came from that and then were experiencing violence in America. Can you just, a general evaluation of all of that? That's a lot to unpack. <laughs> That's a lot, it's like communism and culture and, yeah. and being immigrants. Um, well, the, the generation that came here during the 70s, like my dad's generation, those all, all the, you know, those people, they came uh, during a time when Korea was very nationalistic because um, at that time, time, I think it was uh, his president's name was Rote Wu that took over with a military coup. It's a very nationalistic government that he installed, very, um, uh, um, I can say almost ultra nationalistic because they were going after communists. They were, they were looking for communists, right? Yeah. So um, that mentality transfers over when they came here. And a lot of them never went back to Korea to visit. Yeah. So they didn't see the transformation during the, the uh, the late 90s and 2000s when everything started becoming a little bit more metropolitan and they were becoming a less militaristic and a little bit more yeah you know and um, i heard too that for the rooftop koreans a lot of them had those skills and the ability to just grab up a gun and protect the community because they were required back in korea to join the military is yeah, that what it's happened? um yeah you have to do service for i think it's four years it's either two or four years uh, but every Korean citizen that's even here in the States, I mean, um, they have to go back to Korea and do their service. Mm. So I actually, um, I got my citizenship when I was 24. So I kind of skated under that. But they actually had people coming from the consulate knocking on people's doors saying, okay, we know your son's like 19. Really? Yeah, we're Wait, American people. citizens or no, they have dual citizenship? No, no, there's no dual citizenship. So there were Korean citizens that were residing in oh. America that they would knock and on they the door. Come. They'd come and look for you, <laughs> right. <laughs> It's time to so, go back to the homeland. Yeah, it's time to go back and do your service. <laughs> but there's a lot of uh, stories like that. Like, uh, you know, you guys were mentioning K-pop. A lot of K-pop guys are like that. They, really? they became famous and they hit 18 and then they go and they have to it's do their to service. Join. Yeah. So a lot of them, you know, they lose their fame because they're they're really hot at that moment and they're gone for like two to four years and they come back and they're much older. Right? It's and not like not, Elvis. Yeah, they're, they're not that cute boyish looking kid, right? That all the girls like. Oh, that's right? funny. Like, so. That's funny. Yeah. But um, like 
Koreans, like the, the ones in the South, at least after the war, I mean, there's no reason for them to be communists. I mean, yeah. we, they fought a war over that. I mean, now, what do you think about North Korea and what it became? Well, that's kind of what they want us to become, right? Because North Korea, even though they're communists, I mean, it's really a two-tiered system. And there's a lot of layers in those two tiers, right? There's a lot of parallels into like what they're doing there, like what I'm seeing here, mm -hmm. like the mindset. Because um, there's really no, no new government. I mean, if you think about it, right? I mean, the idea of a democracy or republic was started in Greece, right? And that's been fleshed out to where we are now. Right? And this is probably the best system that we have. And they're trying to implement something that, uh, I mean, communism is basically, uh, it's, it's an elitist form of government that's sold to the masses as being something that's going to be beneficial to them, but it's not, mm -hmm. you know, so. So most of the older generation, they can see right through that. But it's the younger kids, you know, because like, you know, like I, I've told people this before, because free sounds good in any language, no matter how you like present it, because, you know, it's free without people realizing like it's not really free. It comes through other means, like through taxpayers or, you know, uh, it, it comes through basically the people that are, you know, that are working. Yeah. Right. So most people don't see that and realize that because most people don't really um, study economics. You know, that's probably one of the things that we have. Biggest problem we have in this country is finances. Um, a lot of kids don't know how to balance their own checkbook. Don't know how to like handle credit. No one explains to them the finances of that, and even maybe having a small business and, and running that and seeing what that's like. And then you realize it's not all like okay, capitalists and owners are bad and the workers are the heroes. I mean, it's nothing like that. This is it's a purely based on needs, right? I mean, I need a product made, you need work, so I'm gonna hire you at a fair, you know, whatever wage that's gonna be competitive, fair, and then you're gonna do the work and I'm gonna be able to sell my products. So everybody wins, right? But communism isn't isn't built around that. It's built around basically just a small group that has the power that is able to d dictate and determine uh, like decisions without everyone else's input. And then it's gonna work out best for them. What's your message to young men that uh, might find themselves in your shoes in the future? What would you say to them? I mean, like defending? It, no if property. another, I mean, it seems like the left is in favor of promoting this kind of political discourse and mm -hmm. this kind of political action. Say we have a situation where young boys are confronted with, do I protect my community? Do I run and hide because I'll be made into a national figure now and vilified by the president of the United States, national media? What would you think young men should do these days? Well, um, I mean, it's easy to tell them you have to take a stand. Yeah. But that has to come through support from their family, right? I mean, it's hard to do that alone. Yeah. I mean, you got to have your family behind. You got to have friends. But ultimately, I mean, it's a personal choice you have to make. Whether your conscience moves you to do, to take certain actions, you know. And some people they won't because they're just scared, mm -hmm. right? I mean, fear is like, I mean, everyone's scared. But there's a difference between being scared and then, you know, um, finding the courage to overcome that, that fear somehow, right? Because there's something even more pressing uh, besides your fear that's pushing you. Uh, and I think that has to come internally, right? Um, either you're, like from your, your family or how you were brought up, right? Uh, mainly your upbringing, I think. It has a lot to do with that. But anyone who finds themselves in that situation, they have every right to defend themselves, right? I mean, um, I mean, it's better to, to be alive and to be vilified than to be found dead and to be considered a martyr. Nobody wants to be a martyr. Yeah. I mean, I don't, right? I mean, I'm glad I'm here having this conversation with you. And, you know, um, that day in 92 didn't turn out any serious that, that it did because if it did, I mean, it'd be very different. Mm -hmm. It's we'll kind of like base, what we were talking about. Yeah. <laughs> what, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you say that you learned what base is? Oh, yeah. That whole concept of just, you know, if we pursue basic American values in freedom and then build our families on those, then a couple generations from now, we're going to be quite strong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all it is. Do you know what the women and children were doing? What were they staying home? Were they praying trying us. to support? Yeah. Praying for us. That's probably what they were praying and crying. It was what we, women usually would do, you know, making sure like we come home, you yeah. know. Now that you're kind of 
involved in everything. Can you give us a, an explanation of like, what do you do now? I mean, I've, I've seen you go to riots and stuff. You And do the, the counter protesting or are you documenting it? Because I think also these videos uh, that you guys grab when you're there are helping <clears throat> wake up more people to it too. Yeah. Um, let me just go back to what you said regarding politics. Yeah. Um, the churches have to get involved with this as well. Mm. You know, because I think with the lockdowns, there are too many churches that complied with that. Yeah. Right? I mean, they, they shut down the churches, but not what, with liquor, liquor stores and strip joints. Mm -hmm. Right? So um, church leaders have to basically uh, put their 501c status on, you know, um, they're going to have to risk that and, and get involved because that's the only way I think like we're going to be able to push back as a community, especially if you're conservative, even independent. Um, to basically have that voice out there. And, yeah. and, um, the well, and that more, speaks to it too. It's, right. it's like this isn't a, a political party situation. This is a core values issue, mm -hmm. fundamentals. Right. And so nonprofits should be getting involved. This is education. This mm -hmm. is awareness. This is core values and, and the soul of this country. I hate to say Joe Biden says it all the time, but, but that's really what it is. And so there is such a big place for the churches to get involved. Yeah. And, and by that, it means like rethinking what it means to be a leader, to be in your community and to educate. Like right. it's not just sending your kid to public school, it's rethinking how your entire life should be a process of education, of learning. Right. Leadership looks like taking ownership of the people around you and your family and your children and your life. And then community means having those institutions that aren't government institutions, but community institutions. And for some reason, people look at getting involved as just, oh, well, I don't really want to run for office one day. <laughs> I'm like, oh, there's plenty of places for you to get yeah, involved that don't include that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, especially just church-going Christians. I mean, there's a lot of things that they can do within their own community. Uh, one of the things that I started to do is um, after I created the Twitter account and then started documenting videos from different parts of L.A., showing the lockdowns and the closing of small businesses and the for lease signs and just all the empty, you know, the, the businesses that went out of the business during the lockdown. Um, I, I was involved in a, um, in a protest at We Spa, which basically it never took off because it was that, that's where the transgender male went into a women's oh, yeah. uh, spa mm -hmm. and then exposed himself to two minors. So there was a, um, uh, a protest plan by conservatives and independents, you know, regarding that. And then you had two busloads of uh, counter protesters, as they call them, but Antifa show up, you know, two busloads and approximately about 150 to maybe close to 200 of them that showed up and took up four corners of that block and were counter protesting this without realizing like this was, like, you know, against women and minors, you know? Yeah. Um, so with that, um, I, I got into a physical altercation with someone there and that video went viral and, and, and that's kind of how I um, I guess I popped up on in, in the public but yeah it was mine it wasn't my intention to be there I was just there looking out for some people that were weren't were supposed to be there but I, we didn't want them to be there because yeah. it was just the opposition was very overwhelming mm -hmm. um, but one of the things that um, yeah after that the whole we small um, um, I, I you know with help with some other friends like we created a group a security group where basically um, one of the things that really bothered me was was people going out to these rallies and protests and expressing their opinion and then being doxxed and accosted as they're going back to their cars mm -hmm. or even at the at the you know event um, and that really bothered me because that showed me signs of basically um, suppression you know of not being able to express yourself and you know mm -hmm. not being able to come out and, and just Say, state your opinion. I mean, this is America. I mean, you may not agree with what I say, but I, you still ha I still have the right to say it, and you still have the right, you know, you can hear me or not, but you have no right to touch me or physically assault me, right? You can call me whatever you want under the sun. It's not going to bother me, but your right stops where my body begins, right? And that's where I had the biggest issue. And um, after what happened at, at We Spa, um, there was uh, some friends that we all got together and we formed a group and and the group is more of a volunteer security security force, and no one gets paid to do what they do. Uh, we're outfitted with we were outfitted with body cams because what they typically like to do is to uh, manipulate the video and and frame it in a way where you're the aggressor when you may just be defending yourself. So the body cams actually help expose that mm -hmm. to basically show the difference. Uh, and then a month after what happened, at, we spawned Koreatown. There was a huge uh, uh, rally in downtown LA at City Hall, where, um, like, you know, the counter pro Antifa showed up again, 
and there was basically a, a, a street rumble, a street fight between the two groups. And that was pretty much the end of it. Um, and they haven't come out since, you know, since that time. And I think it's because, you know, they were, they were, you know, they got beaten. They were physically beaten, right? So they got a taste of their own medicine. Like what they like to do with, with people like uh, older people, uh, women, children that like to go out and physically, you know, assault them. I mean, there was enough men that stood up and said, we're not going to put up with this anymore. And there was a huge physical confrontation. Um, I ended up getting written up in the Huffington Post and Daily Mail and LA Times, um, uh, basically disparaging me. So in that way, I was kind of made public. Mm. But I don't, you know, I personally don't mind that because it's like, you know, when you start giving excuses like, oh, um, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm going to do this because I don't want to lose my job. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do that. Well, the thing is like, yeah, you retain your job, but like, what's this country going to look like, you know, when your kids come of age or when you have, when they have kids and your yeah. grandkids, like, right. So you got, you retain your job, but you lost your country. I mean, what's the point of that? So in that sense, I feel because of what this country has done for me uh, in terms of my opportunities and being able to meet my wife here. My wife is from Taiwan. Oh, well, and, you met here? Yeah, we met here. My oh. wife is Taiwanese. Uh, my kids are biracial. No, <laughs> no they all look, they all look, they're all Asian, so they all look the same. But yeah, I mean, I owe a debt of gratitude to this country because I was able to create a life here, a future here. My kids are able to grow up here. You know, I made a lot of great friends. Um, so in that sense, I mean, I felt a bit obligated to kind of do what I'm doing now. So yeah. uh, we've created that group and then I got plugged in politically with um, a lot of different conservatives and independents, uh, sharing a lot of different ideas in terms of what's happening in LA, especially LA County. Um, and then also, um, you know, supporting certain candidates. Uh, but at the same time, um, I, we created a gym, a private gym, where we're basically, uh, you know, I've been doing martial arts since I was eight, you know, for a long time. And um, I never really taught because, I mean, I, finance pays better than being running a gym. Uh, at least for me, it did. And, um, you know, I wanted to reach out to, I guess, the, the community in terms of the younger group group, like middle-aged school kids, high school kids, college, uh, give them an environment where they can physically train and see the, um, the transformation of themselves in terms of being physically active and then learning a skill wow. that could be you know, used you know, for practical purposes. At the same time, giving parents um, a place to have a conversation where they don't feel so hampered in terms of being able to you know, watch what they say. Because I think that's kind of what the problem is. I mean, we're all sort of scared of saying the wrong thing, you know, a lot of us are. I think once we get to a point where you can kind of speak freely, it's really liberating because you just kind of say certain things. And before you know it, there's other people that agree with you, but they just don't have the wherewithal to kind of express it themselves. And that gives them, uh, I guess, inspiration and strength in saying like, you know what, I agree with him. I may not be as vocal as he is, but I'm gonna support what he does. So I've had a lot of supporters come out of the woodwork in terms of um, just saying like, yeah, I agree with what you're doing. And, you know, I'm going to help you this way. So I've had a lot of um, support in that sense from people who felt the same way. And I would say, like, I think the majority of the country feels the same way as most do that. We're going in the wrong direction with this whole culture war, letting the left dictate the narrative in terms of what's going on because they control uh, a lot of the media, like news, entertainment, right, and, you know, politics, right? So they're dictating what... Um, their viewpoints are, which is, I think, is a very small minority, but most majority of people don't feel that way. And the, one of the biggest misnomers I think that I hear is calling a state a blue state or a red state, mm. which I think is totally off. There what are no, do you mean by that? What I mean by that is there are no real blue state. It's blue cities. It's the cities. If you look outside of the city and the different suburbs and, and the rural areas, they're all red. They're yeah. all conservative, independent, you know, Very interesting. family oriented. So you have these big pockets of cities, uh, with large population centers that are de determining, like, yeah, we're a blue state. They're not a blue state. Yeah. You know, it's just a blue city. Yeah. You know, but if well, you go in California, outside, especially, it's beautiful there, mm -hmm. and there's so many amazing people, and it's sad to have to leave because it's gotten so bad. I'm from upstate New York, and I can attest to that. Yeah. Well, I don't know what I was joking about. I'm a little radical, but I was like, what if? we rewrote the New York State Constitution. Maybe other states can do it too, but pretty much New York State is controlled by New York City. Mm -hmm. A very small, tiny little place yeah. filled with most of the population. Not most, but a large amount of it. And 
I'm like, what if we rewrote the New York Constitution to be similar to the federal U.S. Constitution where there was better representation, one represented by population, one represented by the land and yeah. proportional to the, the area because it's the entire upstate New York controlled by these five little little boroughs. And it's devastating. A million people moved out of that state in the last 10 years before COVID. Mm. Before COVID. Right. Imagine how many moved out now. Yeah. But it's it's a shame. And my family lives there and I struggle between the danger of putting in, you know, planting my roots there for my future kids versus getting to a new new state right. that could be a little bit safer and then transitioning my family that lives there to that state. It's, what do you do? Yeah, so. we talked about that earlier. Yeah, I struggle with that too. Cause I've lived in California and LA like my entire life, you know, and I'm actually thinking about leaving, right? Um, but it's like, do you stay and fight or do you set roots someplace, you know, put down roots someplace else? And then someone said something, and then someone said this and my wife also reiterates this, which is if you leave, then who else is gonna be left to, to fight, right? And what's going on in LA and in California is like a cancer, yeah. right? And it's gonna spread. It'll, spread. It'll spread throughout the rest of the union. So someone has to, has to stay there and basically be able to push back, yeah. right? The problem that I run into is like, yeah, that makes sense, but then it's already so bad that I'm staying and fighting at a point where they already are making policy that will infringe on me and my children. You know, where mm -hmm. it's like the the requirements that they're expecting to go to public school, the elimination of charter school, private school, pub, um, home school. They want your kid to go to public school mm -hmm. only. They want you to have to get vaxxed in order to go to public school. It's this kind of stuff where it's like that draws, I have to draw the line there and say it's too far gone. Mm -hmm. So that's where like my mentality on it of where where do you determine if it's too far gone or not? I think it has to hit home. It has, it, you know, there's enough people who are, you know, they may hear it in conversation or... Uh, they may see it on TV and say, like, you know what, I don't agree with that. But it hasn't pushed them to the point to be physically out there and to be vocal, right? They just may say in passing, like, yeah, I, I'm not agreeing with that. But it hasn't hit home enough for them to want to get involved. Let's wrap it up and just mm -hmm. we'll end on the initial number that really drove me crazy and made me start the nonprofit to begin with. I saw that officially a majority of my generation would choose socialism and communism over capitalism, economic independence. And I said, this can't be real. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just started looking into it from there and, and was really flabbergasted by everything that I started to realize and, and learn. Um, so when you see these kind of numbers and you see the behavior of some of the young people these days, I personally think a very small amount of them are truly indoctrinated in the sense that they wanna seize the means of production and wear Che Guevara t-shirts and all that stuff. But there's just so many out there that they're kind of lost in the sauce, if you know what I mean. And yeah. I don't blame them. The school system fails them. The culture fails them. Mainstream media fails them. Honestly, families fail them in many ways too. And they're just shoved through this funnel. And when they come out, they're not the best. So, so I want to reach those kind of people and give them purpose, give them a better understanding of the world around them and of their potential. What do you have to say for those people out there that, that need some mentorship and guidance on these things? Uh, first thing is to start working. That's what changes. Like once you start paying your own bills, move out of your parents' house or basement, wherever, and you gotta pay your own bills, you gotta make your own way in the world, that's when I think the, the, the mindset kind of flips a little. Okay. You know, um, that, and then there has to be a, a, a bit of curiosity on their part to question what they've been taught. Yeah. You know, and I think that's one of the issues that we have in this country is there's not a lot of people that ask, well, why is that, right? If they're, if, you know, the top-down approach right now is like we have this mandate right, um, and like the, the whole mask mandate we had in, in LA or like uh, the vaccine mandate. There is enough people to say, why is that? I mean, that's not constitutional, right? So once I think people, you know, younger people start asking that is when things change. And unfortunately, things have to get pretty bad for that to click. Because as long as you're, you're affluent, things are going well, um, I mean, you're not gonna question it because you're living in your own little bubble. You know, and things are going hunky dory well and, and fine. And um, my good example, like during the lockdown that we had, you know, uh, when they said, hey, you got to stay in your home, you know, um, don't go out because there's a virus. This is the beginning of the pandemic or whatever, the virus. Um, like, I went out and I started, you know, I, I ride motorcycles. So I started riding around through the city. And we did the whole thing where we basically, oh, yeah, this is pretty bad because I keep, you know, I watch Chinese news, like, um, 
and I keep track of what's happening in China because I uh, might, you know, have like huge interest in Asia as well. But um, I started riding around and one of the videos I put out was basically, why do we have such a huge homeless population if this is such a bad virus, right? I mean, um, I didn't see anybody else posting that or asking that question, which I thought was really odd because in my imagination, I imagine like, in, I don't know if you've seen the old movies where there's a guy with a cart and he has a belt, he'll bring out your dead, yeah. you know, and a lot of bodies will be lined out in the driveways and stuff. I, that's what I was imagining that it was going to be that bad. But then I'm like, wait, everything is functioning fairly normally. And you have like these homeless encampments that are popping up all over the place. I mean, not to sound callous, you know, but like, shouldn't these guys be the most affected because they're living in the most unsanitary conditions and, yeah. and places? So I think being able to ask why is probably uh, the biggest thing that the younger generation, you know, mm -hmm. um, can have. And I think that's something like maybe like with your platform that you can push, you know, it's like you may not agree with me, but ask yourself, why do I have this opinion? Why do I have this viewpoint? You know, and don't just throw a label on me saying me, I'm, I'm a white supremacist or, you know, I'm a racist, right? Because that's an easy way out, right? But ask yourself, why is that? And then interestingly enough, um, there are a lot of people that I've met that have kind of flipped in terms of having, you know, I used to listen to NPR and I did this and that. I had one one guy um, who told me he, he, at one point he was listening to NPR and he started yelling at the radio, yelling at what they were saying because they knew he, they were out like, they are just outright lying to him, yeah. right? So I think once you get that point where someone realizes that they were lied to and they start questioning the authority, you know, uh, is the authority really for my benefit? Or is it for their own personal benefits? And that's when things kind of flip around and change. Yeah, no, that I think that's a great analysis of the situation. And I think the more the left behaves this way, mm -hmm. they are overstepping. Mm -hmm. And they are providing us opportunities to wake people up where they're going, this is not adding up here. And we have a, I don't know if you've seen it before, but on Instagram, we have a, a new page. We call it the Freedom Guide. Okay. And it's all these little tips and it, pieces of information about uh, products the FDA has approved that are a little sketchy yeah. or it, just information that adds to their ability to live a more free lifestyle and also leads to them probably questioning, wait, why was this approved or why why did this happen in the first place or how come no one has told us that this is the real connection between big pharma and this this item that is promoted by our government. So I think just every little thing that we can do to make people more aware of the fact that they should be questioning things mm -hmm. will help with with the big wave that we're trying to achieve. But yeah. Tony, thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you for I having me. I really appreciate it. And, I hope you have a safer time getting back on your plane. No TSA check. Well, I'm pretty sure they'll check me again, but I'm okay <laughs> with that. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Hey guys, it's Morgan. Before we head out, I just want to say thank you for watching The Freedom Records. And thank you so much to American Journey Experience for letting us film here in Dallas, Texas at their vault. You guys, this place is filled with world and American history artifacts. It's fascinating to learn the details of the objects that are right behind us on set. So thank you to American Journey Experience for letting us film here. And actually, you guys can come here yourself. So go to the link in our bio to learn how you can do that and how you can get connected to this great place. Thank you.